with me to 1 Samuel and we're going to be looking at excerpts from chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. A little bit of background here. This was during the time that um, David was hunted down by Saul, who had just got from bad to worse. And, uh, I mean, he was even um, consulting mediums. Um, But let me tell you, have, have any of you ever read the book, The Three Kings? Please get it. It is a book you can read in a day. But it's an an awesome um, uh, expression and and, um, uh, way of bringing balance into a person's life that feels that they've been grieved or hurt. um, It is just an incredible book. As I said, you know, I've I've got a few of them I, I, I give out occasionally. Um, when someone's sort of feeling sorry for themselves. Um, But (coughs) that really explains the tension between Saul, David, and then, of course, David's son, Absalom. But we always think of Saul as this demented king. In fact, he was one of the most successful kings in all history, if you look at his achievements. Now, as he got older, he got a bit... We don't know what caused the dementia or whatever it was, but he started to get off the rails. And, of course, David comes along, and, you know, this just fuels it. Um, so David is running from this, this king that is after his blood. He's got about 600 vagabonds, you know, who are r- running around with him, and, and they fight his um, and they even cut a deal with the Philistines so that, you know, they can get into Philistine country and camp out and stuff like that. Um, and the Philistines are, like, not too sure of this because they're thinking, don't want these guys in battle in case they turn against us in the middle of battle. So they've asked, um, even though they respect and honor David, they've asked him to sort of leave. But he and his family and the families of these 600 or so men all live in a place called Ziklag. Ziklag. And um, they're coming back from one of their exploits, and uh, lo and behold, the Amalekites have been, and they have burnt everything down. They have taken their wives, their children, They've taken their livestock. I mean, they've left nothing. So, you know, if you ever think that you're in a predicament, I think this message today will really help you. Because I don't think there are a lot of us that have just rocked up and there's absolutely nothing. You know, and not not only did they take their... um, they burn down their, their homes and, and take their livestock, but their wives and their children were also taken. And in verse 30, in verse 6, it says this David was greatly distressed, for the men spoke of stoning him because the souls of them all were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's the Amplified. I I don't care what you're going through. Let me tell you, very seldom will anyone experience what David experienced there. Now, I think we're going to gleam a lot from this. Last week, we had Marty Blackwell there. Ha, ha, ha. He, he, hey. Um, But he he ministered on the importance of laughing in the face of adversity. And it it is important. But he also mentioned some things that, you know, I believe we are in this, um, what he called, turnaround season. And um, 
as things are turning around um, and as we're coming into the fullness of what God has promised us, there are some things he wants us to remember to do. Um, and this is what I want to pick up on. He mentioned some things like praise and, uh, you know, but I want to pick up on this thing that David did. He encouraged himself. And I believe that, you know, as we're waiting, as things have turned around and we've stepped into certain things, as the season of prosperity is here, as the fulfillment uh, the, of our dreams and expectations for 2012, it is going to happen, amen, amen. that I believe we are probably very likely going to need to encourage ourselves. Amen. Amen. There will be times in your life where there is no one around to encourage you. Times when discouragement tries to grip you and somehow you need to find strength to carry on. If that happens, you've got to do what David did. You've got to imitate him. You've got to encourage yourself. Now, our opening verse clearly states that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Very important that we don't leave that out. Um, all of us will face difficulties in our lives. However, we can have victory over them if we keep our eyes on God. Yes. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, I keep my eyes always, say always, always, on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Now, it's interesting because the person who wrote that was David. So he knew and believed and had revelation of the principle here that if you keep your eyes on God, you can't be shaken. You know, whatever happens, you, he's at your right hand, you keep your eyes on him, you will not be shaken. In 1 Samuel 30, David and his band of soldiers, as I've just mentioned, had just returned home only to find that Ziklag had been burned to the ground and their wives and children carried off by the Amalekites. Discouraged is not a strong enough word, <laughs> let me tell you, um, to describe how they felt. The Bible says that they wept bitter tears until they simply had no more strength to weep. That's verse 4. Not many of us have experienced a day as bad as this. David returned home only to discover that his enemies had destroyed or stolen everything that was important to him and his men. And as their leader, it was even worse for David. He knew that he must take full responsibility for this tragic situation and find a way of turning things around. Notice that in verse 6, it starts off by saying this, Now David was greatly distressed. The loss of his family had seriously affected him. You know, he wasn't trying to act macho. You know, he was real. And sometimes we've got to be real. You've got to start off being transparent and real. He could have just acted, but the men knew him. They knew that he was a tender-hearted person underneath that great leadership. Uh, and and in, in fact, he was a great military leader, that there was this tender heart, because, you know, they probably heard him playing his harp and singing. So as he sat among the ruins of uh, Ziglag and his grieving men spoke of stoning him, he had a choice to make. He could allow grief and bitterness to overcome him and sink into the black hole of despair, or he could not give up and pursue his enemies. But before he was able to do anything, he would have to get his strength and courage back. As David looked around him, he saw nothing but discouragement, and everyone was downcast and forlorn. There wasn't one person there to encourage him. He only had one option. He had to encourage himself in his God. Now, there will be times when, you know, you think, well, they're my friends, they're my family, they this, they that. Why aren't they encouraging me? And that only pushes you further into discouragement. 
Because the best way to get encouragement is to encourage yourself. It's guaranteed that way. It's a choice to encourage yourself in the Lord your God. David chose to encourage himself because there was no other option. The most important thing to notice here is that David did not encourage himself in himself. That is a fruitless exercise. You might sort of pick yourself up and, you know, you're getting altitude and then suddenly... In fact, and too many people spend too much time trying to encourage themselves or strengthen themselves in themselves. Don't try it. Do it in your, the Lord your God. You see, this wasn't just about David and his family. For David had a covenant with God, and therefore he made this tragic situation God's business. When you encourage yourself in your God, in the Lord, you make it God's business as well. David knew his covenant. I mean, in, in chapter 17, which isn't, you know, too far past, he had just confronted Goliath. And he defeated Goliath because he understood covenant. It was all about covenant. Yes, you know, he, he was skillful with his... But, but he knew, listen to this. Um, Goliath had cursed David by his God. So David was able to call on his covenant rights. And he said this. He said, you come, with me, you come to me with sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. See, when earlier he sort of looked at him and discarded him and actually insulted him by his God. moment he did that, he a covenant. If he curses me, he's cursed. I've won. We've got to understand our covenant rights as well when we're in a situation where if, if someone, if we are being opposed and we start to encourage ourselves in our God, we bring God into that situation. That is our covenant right. And when they hassle us, when they curse us, when they oppose us, they oppose our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we were in South Africa, we had this brand new BMW that Lorraine and I bought, and um, very proud of it. It was a white one. And we went to a restaurant, came out, and lo and behold, German takeaway. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't know how it's supposed to have all these gadgets and gizmos so no one can steal it. It, it had gone. Of course, everyone at the church said, well, if it's gone, it's over the border already. It's this, it's that. But God dropped something into our hearts. He said, who can steal from me? Out of the covenant that we have with God, we knew that if, if we had um, the right attitude and we knew our covenant rights, then they couldn't steal from God. And they found it in this little state called Kwakwa. Uh, it had miraculously been left outside a police station. <laughs> and it had been used in a bank robbery, gone over, they left it there, and no one understands why they didn't just put a match to it, because that's what they always do. But there it was. All I had was like 340 kilometers more on the clock. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Who can steal from God? Yes. No one can steal from God. So those that oppose you, if you encourage yourself in your God, you bring him in on that situation. And through your covenant rights, you can establish something. You establish the victory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. From what I know about David, it's easy to imagine how he went about encouraging himself. He probably took his harp, retreated to a solitary place, and began to sing songs of praise to God. No doubt David didn't feel like singing. 
But he did it anyway. And he didn't sing a sad lament. Instead, he sang of the majesty and awesome power of God. He sang of the creator who had spoken the worlds into existence. He sang of the deliverer who had already given him improbable and impossible conquests. Victory over the lion, victory over the bear, victory over the Philistine giant, Goliath. Through praise, David was able to instantly change his focus. On the wings of a song, his spirit was able to be lifted above his present circumstances into the presence of the one who is high and lifted up. The melodies from David's harp filled the air as the psalmist sang praises to God, who trans- to the God who transcends all limitations. You know, praise is just an incredible weapon. But it's also something that takes you out of a place and puts you where he is. God inhabits the praises of his people. You know, we always see that as God coming to us. No, it's because we are lifted up to where he is. Praise lifts you up and puts you in a place where you are untouchable because you are praising a God who transcends human limitations. I can easily imagine David sitting in the ashes of what was once his home or his hometown with a harp in hand singing these words, Psalm 34, verses 1 to 4. I will bless the Lord at all times. Does that mean at all times? Yes, the Hebrew translation is at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I like that. At all times, continually. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. David sang, I will bless the Lord at all times. All times. That means the good times, the bad times, the great times, the terrible times, the happy times, the sad times, at all times. At all times. Even on the worst day of your life, God is still worthy of praise. No matter what is happening to you, no matter what you're going through, God is still worthy of praise. Amen. Because otherwise, your situation is greater than him. And just starting there, let me tell you, never ever forget that. Starting there will draw you toward victory and success. David sang praises to the Lord from the ashes of Ziglag. Praising God is a pathway to encouragement. When praise is in your mouth, there can be no grumbling. No complaining, no pity party, no negative speaking. Praise is the language of faith. If you want to strengthen your faith, begin to praise God. Then David sang another phrase. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Magnifying means to make something bigger in perspective. It, you don't make it bigger in reality, right. do you? So if you take a magnifying glass or a telescope or you know, whatever you're using, the reality is that that is still a speck or still tiny, but your perspective of it changes because it is magnified. Likewise, you cannot make God any greater than he already is. Yet you can magnify or reduce your perspective of him. Now, I want you to just think about that. You know, when you're going through hard times, you can take your magnifying glass and look at your situation and make it bigger. Your perspective of it will go, whoa. You know, But if you measure it against God, it's a speck in the universe. That's really how 
insignificant it is. But on the other hand, you can either magnify God, because he says, let's magnif magnify God with me. Now, we don't make him greater or bigger than he is, but our perspective of him changes. We just see how awesome he is, and everything else is brought into perspective. Hallelujah. I ask you this, are you magnifying your despair, or are you magnifying your faith? Refuse to magnify the devil's work in your life, and you will have a correct view of him. The Bible tells us that one day we're going to see him and go, was that you? That's the right perspective. Amen. Don't analyze your problem with a magnifying glass. Because that's going to lead you into pitiful discouragement. Now, if I'm reading your mail, don't come and speak to me afterwards. I'm just going to tell it as is. Christians are in the habit of magnifying their problems. They like to analyze them. And the only way they can analyze them is to take out the magnifying glass. And every problem is like, <laughs> wow, can you see that? But the reality is, if we turn and we magnify our God, Amen. don't get into that habit. That's why you live in that sort of negative place. Instead, magnify the Lord your God. Speak of his greatness, his power, his might. Talk about his awesome and powerful deeds. God is the one you can rely on. Amen. How many times has he delivered you from the brink of destruction? Why don't you talk about that? Give praises, give testimony to all the wonderful things he's done about you. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 10 said, He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. <laughs> Amen. Oh, him, on him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Hey, guys, this is real. God, what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do in the future is all the same thing. He loves you enough to deliver you from everything. Amen. That's why he is our Savior. Amen. That's what Savior is. God wants us to be free. But he also wants us to be encouraged at all times. For that reason, he has given us the means by which we can encourage ourselves in him. Here are three pointers. Accept the truth that you do not have to stay encouraged. Or discouraged, I should say. Accept the truth. <laughs> okay, just, just had to wake a couple of you up. I mean, some of you didn't even know I'd made a mistake. <laughs> Accept the truth that you don't have to stay discouraged. I mean, that's step one. Too many of us are in this massive pity party. You know, we're discouraged. All things are going wrong. And it's just a decision away. You can encourage yourself. You can get out of discouragement. You can change that right now. It's like a bird that flies over your head. You don't have to let it nest in your hair. You can shoo it away. Same with discouragement. I'm just kidding. I mean, it's a metaphor. <laughs> also, you can change your perspective of view, and you will immediately see something else and be encouraged. I liken it to standing on a mountain. You can be on a mountain top, and you can turn, and one view is heavy, Rain clouds and thunderstorms and lightning. And that's there in the distance. But in the other 
side of the mountain. You can look out, and it's clear blue skies and serene, you know, views and the sea. And I mean, it's just beautiful. But being who some of us are, guess what? We camped out here. <laughs> and we wonder why we're discouraged. Oh, have you ever seen such dark clouds? <laughs> just look at them. Look how they're just swirling around. I wonder when it's going to hit us. <laughs> A few steps away, different view. It's as simple as that. Hallelujah. So remember, you can be discouraged or you can be encouraged. And you can also encourage yourself. Right, number two. Stop giving voice to your discouragement and start giving voice to your encouragement. Amen. Stop repeating the lies of the devil and start speaking the promises of God. Stop speaking out fear and start speaking out faith. Stop talking about the problems and start talking about the solution. Find out what the Word of God has to say about your situation and then speak it out boldly. Amen. Number three, important one, meditate on the Lord. Don't meditate on your problem. One of the Hebrew words for meditate literally means to murmur and implies the moving of lips. Another word means to converse with yourself. It is your self-talk, the way you speak to yourself in your head about things in your life. Every day, everyone meditates on something. Everyone has a conversation going on in their heads. I know it doesn't look like with some people, but <laughs> they all have, I promise you. Uh, now, the thing is, we are meditating on something. We are thinking about something. We are pondering on things. It's what you ponder on that determines your mood, your attitude. And those attitudes determine a lot of other things in your life. So we've got to be careful what we meditate on. Practice meditating on the Lord, and guess what? You will find all his attributes. Peace, joy, love. Meditate on the wrong thing, and you'll find the wrong focus. And that's going to draw you into the wrong place. But meditation can also bring about success and prosperity. Amen. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips, former meditating. And then it says, Meditate on it day and night, so that you, say you, you. may be careful to do everything written in it. For then you, say you, will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. When you meditate, you are empowered by God. So whatever, here is the principle, whatever you meditate on empowers you. Amen. Ow, oh, ow, ow, oh, ow. If you are meditating on negative destructive, evil, whatever you want to call it, fearful things, guess what? They are empowering you. But you meditate on God, on His Word, then His Word empowers you. And it makes you then have the ability to make your way prosperous and succeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you can have that, or you can have disaster and tragedy and fear and anxiety and all those other things. But I don't know about you. I'm in first line here. I, this is what I want. So I'm going to meditate on God's Word. I'm going to focus on Him. I'm going to magnify Him. I'm going to praise Him at all times. Hallelujah. Observe, true meditation is not a matter of positive thinking. 
I'm not trying to persuade myself. Oh, this is going to happen. I'm going to marry me. No. Neither is encouragement. They both are matters of faith. It is not about us. It's about him. Let your meditation be about the Lord, about his love, about his word, about his promises, about his goodness, about his deeds of power. As you do that, you will be able to cast your cares on him with the assurance that he cares about everything that's going on in your life. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Discouragement will tell you that you have nothing going for you and that everything is going against you. But encouragement tells you that you have everything going for you and it doesn't matter what you have going against you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God is on your side. And with the provision for every need and the answer for every problem you have. That is why Jesus came and why, like King David, you too can encourage yourself in the Lord your God at all times. But pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, it doesn't matter what you're going through. You can encourage yourself. You have no excuse. It's a decision away. Now, some of you are looking, I wish I didn't come to church today. <laughs> Last thing I needed to hear was this message, that I can deal with it. I've been praying for God to deal with it. God says, no, no, encourage yourself. Right. Encourage yourself. That's where the victory is. Amen. 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 You know, too many of us want God to come and change our nappy and, you know, put the dumb air in our mouth and let us kick our toys out the cot and all that. Let me tell you, he'll do it. But there's a time when you've heard, and then he holds you accountable for, you for what you've heard. So the upside is you've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God is on your side. If God be for us, who can be against us? So remember this. If you can encourage yourself in the Lord during hard times learning to govern your emotions and maintain your joy, then in the end you will always find victory. This is a promise of God. Therefore, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Does wherever mean in church? Yes. In my car, yes. In my workplace, yes. When I'm on holiday, yes. When I'm down, yes. <laughs> Wherever you go. Joshua 1 verse 9. I'd like to end by examining what David did after he encouraged himself in the Lord. Is anyone getting anything here today? Yeah, good. Guys at the back as well? Okay, praise God. I like these messages because, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to be sitting around moping all day. <laughs> yeah, I, I like God to come and just, yeah, wake up. Encourage yourself. Look at verse 7. The first thing he did was to ask the priest to bring an ephod to him. Now, are you saying, oh, Pastor Chris, what is an ephod? <laughs> well, I must admit, I had to look it up because I wanted to make sure that I was getting the right image here. Now, an ephod is an outer garment that the high priest wore, um, almost like a long waistcoat, but intricately uh, woven, and uh, meaning some really bright, fine uh, uh, threads that they used. But... Here we have a vagabond, a, a relegate, a, an outcast, asking the priest to bring him it. Now, I thought, why? And who's going to wear this thing? Let's just read on. Let's look at verse 7. So it says, that, uh, verse 6, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then verse 7, Then David said to uh, Abitha, the priest, um, 
please bring the ephod here to me. And uh, Abiathar brought the ephod to David in verse 8. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop, or shall I overtake them? And he answered, this is the Lord, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake or overthrow them, and without fail recover all. Well, let's just backpedal here. So he's encouraged himself. He's got his strength back. He knows he can go and pursue his enemies. But what does he do? Before he does anything, he wants to hear from God. So he gets the ephod. Now this represents an oracle. So I assume, because if he asked the priest to bring it, I think he wanted to either touch it or wear it or have something, because it represented an oracle. An oracle is bringing a message from God. So he wanted to hear from God. It doesn't say that the priest put it on. It doesn't say that he put it on. So I'm just assuming that either he wanted it there so that he could put it on and be the oracle, or that the priest could put it on and he be the oracle. But one thing, doesn't matter who wore it, one thing is that he wanted to hear from God and he wanted to be sure that he heard from God. Now most of us would have encouraged ourselves, got our strength back, done all the thing, and then said to all the guys, we're out of here. We're going to go get our wives and our families and our children back. He didn't. He was strong. He was encouraged. But the first thing he did was go and find out what God was to say about the situation. So what did he do? He inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue the troop? Shall I overthrow them? And God said, pursue, for you shall surely overthrow them and without fail recover all that was stolen. After you've encouraged yourself in the Lord and you have regained your strength, you must remember to ask God what you should do next. Important! Even as things are being turned around to your advantage, you still need to hear from God. Having heard from God, David was able to pursue his enemies and overthrow them. Look at this. Verses 18 and 19 declares, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. He had two wives. <laughs> well, his son had a thousand, so I mean, you know. Two was like, okay, for that time. Um, his two wives, nothing was missing. Young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken, David brought everything back. The New King James said, David recovered all. Now I want you to just focus on this, very important. This is the turnaround season. Yeah, we've had a man of God come and speak it out. So things are being turned around to our advantage. The all opposition has been brought to naught. Have you sensed that? That, that? that somehow there's that opposition, that antagonism in the spirit is like, oh, wow, this feels good. It's been turned around. Hallelujah. But so many of us need to expect to recover all. I mean this. I'm speaking it out prophetically. Yes. This turnaround season is for you to recover all. Amen. Amen. See, that was, that's what happened to David. He encouraged himself. He got strong. He went and checked it out with God. God said, go get him. Right? Because you're going to get everything back. But I'm going to show you, he didn't get everything back. He got more. He got more. So you have to, in this time, that you have to encourage yourself. Because after all, it's a week gone by when uh, it was spoken out and in fact, nothing's happened. I don't know, but 
The year hasn't ended. <laughs> Hallelujah. And as long as you've got breath, you praise God. Amen. Let me tell you. You praise him. If there delays, it's because you haven't praised, let me tell you. So we've got to expect to recover all. Do whatever God tells you to do, and you won't be disappointed. But David didn't just get back what he and his men had lost. He got back much more. If you read on, it says that now he rocked up with 400. It's interesting how the Bible is so balanced. He, he, he had 600 men, 200 of them were so exhausted they couldn't come. So only 400 went, and then um, they, because they had insight, intel, um, they were able to go exactly where these guys were, and they were celebrating all their victories, and they just nailed them. And uh, they, they conquered them. 400 young men ran off on camels. So he came with 400. They destroyed everything. They took, got all their wives and their children and their possessions back and livestock, and they, God allowed 400 young men to escape. But they came back. And of course, the 400 soldiers that had gone in came back and said, these guys don't deserve anything. We've got all our stuff. We've got more than enough. We've got all the enemies, the Amalekites' um, uh, uh, possessions and, and all the livestock that they plundered from other people as well. And David says, no. And he made this a decree, which still exists today, and that it doesn't matter whether you fought or you haven't fought, that you are still to share in the spoils. So he divided. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Because Jesus used the same principle. For we are more than conquerors. It means that, that we don't fight, but we conquer. Same principle. Jesus came up with the spoils, and he distributed them to us, even though we did not move a muscle. Same thing. So he comes back, and he says, right, no, everyone's going to benefit. And then he names his friends. And to each one, he did the same thing. He blessed him. I love that. Amen. I don't know about you, but I know, I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, you know. No, that's not that exciting. <laughs> that, that you can encourage yourself to a point where you're strengthened, that you can go back here from God, go into battle, come out with the spoils, and get what the devil has stolen from you and more. And then you can bless everyone. Amen. Then you can bless everyone. That's what the Christian life is about. Amen. It's not just recovering what you've, you know, what you've lost, what's been stolen from you. It's getting more than enough, and Pastor Paul mentioned it. You know, the, the windows of heaven opened on these guys. Hallelujah. The turnaround season is a season of abundant prosperity. Let's start thanking God for that. Amen. Amen. And let's start thanking God for that right now. Amen. Amen. We will praise Him at all times. We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Asia, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.